Hello, friend. Hey. Can you unmute? There you go. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. I'm sure that a lot of people are um, know of you, at least from your time in Tallahassee. So I'll just uh, do a quick introduction. Okay. Um, thanks for coming to our last session, everybody. This is Dr. Jeffrey Ames, who um, has been a friend of mine since I don't Ooh. even know how long. I think we first met when I was in high school, maybe. Oh, my in, gosh. In Carolyn Bridger's piano studio. Yeah. So we go way, way back, but he is um, an accomplished uh, musician in so many fields, piano and, and voice and choral conducting. And he's the director of choral activities at Belmont University um, up in Nashville. And uh, he also spent a lot of years in Tallahassee, not just mm -hmm. in school, but as choral director at Lincoln High School. And we also... Uh, worked on staff together at Trinity United Methodist um, yep. for a while. So I will uh, let Dr. Ames take it away. Thank you so much. Well, good evening. Thank you again for the uh, opportunity to be with you. And uh, it's always nice to see what I consider home folks. So uh, Florida is that second home. And uh, yeah, spent uh, 13 years there. So um, we like to try to get back about four times a year to get to the beach. So um, there's a uh, so yeah, there's a lot of love there. Uh, I'm going to see if I can share my screen and have a PowerPoint for tonight. Are we seeing everything okay? Looks good to me. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. I was curious to say somebody needs to say something because <laughs> I can't see you anymore. <laughs> Anytime, oh, Jeff. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. All right. Well, uh, tonight is going to be a, um, a, a big history lesson, if you will. Um, and we are going to look at more than spirituals and concert gospel, uh, the choral music in the Western European tradition by contemporary African-American composers. So I'm very happy to be with you tonight. And again, I thank Elizabeth for the invitation. So a typical discussion of black music will immediately bring to mind the obvious styles, jazz, blues, soul, gospel, and or spirituals. Persons entering the discussion will probably be able to name without too much difficulty, several prominent musicians from each of these categories. Discussions in other areas of musical style, however, would reveal a lack of awareness to the numerous Blacks who have consistently made contributions. It's a quote by Effie Gardner. I think it was uh, in her dissertation as well. So let's, uh, let's learn some history. For centuries, arrangements of Negro folk songs and spirituals have been commonly recognized and attributed to well-known African-American composers such as Jester Harrison there, who also had a, uh, uh, a, a television career later on in life, Paul Johnson, William Dawson, and most everyone knows Moses Hogan, Stacy Gibbs, who's also a wonderful uh, ranger of spirituals, and Undine Smith Moore. These composers have had a tremendous impact upon the cultural development of African Americans and continue to function as a vital component of American history and American music. Consequently, many people, especially choral directors, are not aware of the vast array of non-spiritual compositions that have been composed by African Americans.
Let's go to the antebellum era, around 1847 to 1860. Non-spiritual compositions composed by African-Americans have been traced as far back as the antebellum era. Additionally, the antebellum era can be recognized as a period of awakening for African-American composers and musicians. At that time, there were only a few composers such as William Apo, Henry Williams, and Frank Johnson who were writing in the Western European tradition. Now, Henry Williams, he was a composer who was among the first contributors to the repertory of Afro-American art music. So at the time, it's a piece entitled Laureate. It's in the 19th century, and it's basically um, a pattern after an Anglo-American sentimental ballad. He has the Sunnyside Polka, which stylized the Bohemian dance. And also an anthem that he wrote for Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving entitled, Oh Give Thanks. So what you see there and can imagine, or if you were able to hear it, it will give you insight of the choral music and church, churches of his period. Now the primary composer and advocate of this era was Frank Johnson, who was responsible for raising the standards of music performed by African Americans to a higher artistic level. Because of Johnson's leadership, many United States and abroad began to acknowledge black classical musicians. Regrettably, when African-American composers continued to write in the Western European tradition, they battled one common obstacle, racial discrimination. Why? Well, many people perceived the spirituals were the only noteworthy contribution by black composers. This was a dominant force that hindered Blacks who were aspiring to become respected composers of the Western European tradition. Since many perceived that the spirituals were the only noteworthy contribution, racial discrimination became that, dominate, that dominant force. As an example, this composer here, R. Nathaniel Dett. He was a distinguished director of the Hampton Institute Singers in Hampton, Virginia, uh, obtained degrees from Oberlin and Eastman. He was studied composition with Nadia Boulanger, who was a very famous composition uh, composer. And um, as again, he was the director of the Hampton Institute Singers. And Hampton is an HBCU, historically black college and university. Nathaniel Dett, he shared uh, in one of his uh, books about Hampton's, his choir's performance at the cathedral in Salzburg. So after they had the performance, they neared the exit and the tour guide was just full of praise and thanks. He said, that was the most beautiful Ave Maria I've ever heard. But I don't think I know who the composer is. So, um, Dad said, not wishing to create a scene within sacred precincts, I waited till we were outside before softly saying, it's mine. But that was a cute story. The decades of the 1920s and the 1930s were turbulent times for concert musicians and composers. Many performers, Regardless of their talent or level of skill, they could not begin to, to gain a career in the United States because of the color of their skin. Therefore, the barriers of racial discrimination forced many performers to begin their career elsewhere. 
that usually occurred in Europe. Ironically, this period of social unrest in the United States produced four prominent African Americans who were among the most sought after and highly paid concert artists in the United States. Those people were Roland Hayes and Marion Anderson. Dorothy Maynard, Paul Roberson. I, it wasn't until I was doing research uh, on this topic several years ago that I discovered who Dorothy Maynard uh, was and what a beautiful instrument she had. Um, wonderful soprano and I just uh, found her on YouTube. She is, she's wonderful, wonderful. And we all know Paul Roberson from his both operatic roles as well as musicals. Although these performers were highly sought after, it was very difficult for the black classical composer to get their music published and performed. So during the mid 20th century, there were some discriminatory viewpoints. Blacks felt the classical music, uh, uh, the classical musicians were traitors to their heritage. Why are we going to study um, classical piano? Why are we uh, trying to be operatic singers? We should be doing the music of our people. The majority of Blacks found it undesirable to compose, conduct, or perform art music. Another reason why Caucasians felt that Blacks are too inferior for concert music. Actually, there was a um, music critic in New York about four or five weeks ago who said something that was very inappropriate about a, um, a, a musician of, of color. It's like a Black uh, oh, it was, it was a pianist. Um, black pianists can't play as well as those who are not of color. Um, so that mentality is still vibrant here. And then Blacks were only appreciated as entertainers, as art musicians, and as pop singers. So what was an outcome? Classically trained African-American musicians became victims of the propaganda. So we got to the bottom of the barrel. Let's see if we can move on, uh, uh, improve this. So the Harlem Renaissance, which happened around 1920 to 1929 was another historical event that afforded black composers an opportunity to gain exposure as well as deserved recognition. During this decade in American history, New York's Harlem became the center of African-American intellectual life. The Harlem Renaissance was a period of enlightenment that focused on the folk music of the African-American race. But the Renaissance also produced a stronger awareness of black nationalism. So some composers, they really took to this. They employed nationalistic trends in their music as advocated by Dvorak. And we know that from Dvorak's New World Symphony, he uh, employed a spiritual into the, uh, the Largo movement. Composers wrote art songs to poems and prose that was written by other black artists and poets. They interpolated melodies and harmonies from spirituals and the blues and integrated African rhythms within their classical compositions. Now, as a result of these practices, concert series began to pop up all over the place and they consistently um, showcased 
the music by Black composers. So the Harlem Renaissance really, it was a rebirth, um, both from a, uh, a, a liter literary and also from a classical um, uh, standpoint. We get the literary, we, we know Hughes, we know Conti, um, we know the prose riser, uh, writers, we know Zora uh, Neil Hurston, um, we know the music and um, uh, Cotton Club, but it's really, really, really important to realize that it also gave birth to uh, the classical composer. So the post-Harlem Renaissance through today. Let's take a look at this. So during the 1930s and the 1940s, many black musicians studied compositions, composition with professors who were teaching at HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. For this generation of composers, HBCUs proved to be an invaluable institution for musicians of color. Faculty and students alike composed works for the university's ensembles, which were essentially the only performers that would perform their compositions, but they did so proudly. Making a difference. These two ladies made a difference. We're looking at Florence Price on the left and Margaret Bonds on the right. They were, uh, Margaret Bonds studied with Florence Price, but they were also very, very good friends. And they shared uh, uh, families at, at times, at one time they did um, live together. Florence Price, she was, she's noted as the first black female composer to gain national notoriety. She won a major competition with her symphony number no. one in E minor to become the first uh, composer of African descent to have a symphonic work performed by a major orchestra. And that was the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 1933. Now with Margaret Bond, she was a pioneering black female composer and pianist as well to be recognized in the US. She collaborated a lot with Langston Hughes from the Renaissance. And she also won a national composer competition uh, with uh, one of her works. And she got to premiere prices Symphonic Symphony Number no. One in E Minor with the Chicago Symphony. I wish they were still here. <laughs> Let's move on up a little higher. We got people like Ulysses K on the left and Julia Perry on the right. Now, unlike the previous two decades, the 20s and the 30s, this group or these people represented a group of composers who studied at the Curtis Institute of Music, at Eastman, Juilliard, and Yale. Now we are finding, or they were finding that our very own black composers became respected musicians who also earned advanced degrees and establish their careers via the same avenues as their Caucasian counterparts. The tutelage African-American composers received unleashed in an unimaginable opportunity. For example, Ulysses K was awarded two pre de Rome prizes to study in Italy. Julia Perry was awarded the Boulanger Grand Prix and two Guggenheim fellowships. This next composer, George Walker, he's the first black to receive a Pulitzer Prize in music, 1996. I had the, 
distinct honor of writing my dissertation on the choral works by George Walker and to speak with him in depth and share with him about his music and his life. Uh, I was, the, the world was saddened when he passed away two years ago. George Walker, as a pioneering music musician and composer, he was the first Black to win the Philadelphia Youth Auditions, which resulted in a re performance of the Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto Number no. 3 with Eugene Ormady and the Philadelphia Orchestra. He was also the first Black to receive a DMA from Eastman School of Music. And as a previous state, previously stated, he has or held the distinct honor of being the first African-American composer to receive a Pulitzer Prize for in music for his um, string work entitled Lilacs. So today I think we have a new renaissance. More musicians realize the value of performing non-idiomatic contributions by Black composers, performing more than just spirituals and concert gospel. Black composers continue to receive high quality training. They continue to receive prestigious prizes and awards, fellowships and commissions. And more exposure is, has been gained through scholarly theses and dissertations, which have been written primarily by Black students. I'm happy to be a part of that new renaissance. Here are some others. You may know of some works by Dr. Osephine Pyle. She's at Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama, along with her husband, Dr. William Powell. And the Powells are products of Florida State as well. We have Dr. Adolphus Hellstork, uh, who uh, was on the faculty at Old Dominion University in Virginia. Um, wonderful choral composer as well as symphonic composer. Brittany E. Boykin, there is on the left. She is pursuing her doctorate degree right now in Atlanta. Uh, she uh, has beautiful, beautiful writing, very, very lyric. Um, and uh, on the right there is Dr. Mark Butler, who's right in your backyard at Florida a and University as the director of choral activities. Mark also has a beautiful gift for composing spirituals as well as concert music. David Hurd um, is a well-known organist and uh, recitalist, worked in the Episcopal Church for a number of years. Um, his writing is also beautiful and, uh, and as I, and I can say this, having um, sung in the Episcopal Church uh, with the thanks to the graces of Bessie Calhoun um, for a period of time, his music would be highly suitable for worship services. Uh, Reverend Dr. Lena McGlynn, who's still with us, I think she is close to 90, um, but uh, she has also uh, written uh, several concert music works as well as spirituals. Carlos Simon, uh, you can see him there, he's in the studio. Uh, and Carlos Simon has not been afraid to um, step outside of the box and incorporate um, uh, electronic music and uh, tracks all within the realm of um, choral concert music. So he is up and coming. Um, he has been on the road uh, as a pianist and, um, uh, and he's, he's a, a really, really strong musician. And then that guy there on the other side is me, yay. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to compose both um, 
spirituals and concert gospel, uh, which is a term that I coined for concert music that is accessible for classically trained singers, yet still suitable for the concert stage. And, uh, and also to, uh, to compose uh, concert music. And the, the piece that is most relevant to my Tallahassee years, I would say, is uh, entitled In Remembrance, which uh, was written for the Potts family. Don't know uh, if there have been longtime Tallahasseans with us tonight, uh, but may uh, remember a prominent doctor, Dr. William Bill Potts and um, his family uh, were in Tallahassee for a number of years. And I think his wife is still there um, and, uh, and members of their family. And the Potts girls, they all attended Lincoln High School. And um, unfortunately there was a tragic accident in um, 2005. Summer, I believe it's summer 2000, no, summer 2002, sorry, that took the lives of Bill, um, daughter, middle daughter, Anna, and youngest daughter, sorry, middle daughter, Becca, and youngest daughter, Anna. And um, it was a, um, a, a traumatic time for me just because I just said my goodbyes to, to Lincoln High School and I was on my way to FSU to begin my, uh, my studies. And um, then that accident happened. So I started writing and I will tell you that what I wrote was just something to get me through the night, basically. And um, hang on a second, I'm gonna stop sharing here. And I need to, I'll just be dark for a little second and then I'll turn my light back on. Um, and I, I, like I said, I wrote something to get through tonight and to try to give me a little peace and comfort. And um, it, um, it was, it sufficed for the moment. But I tried to go back and finish the piece because I wasn't happy with it at all. Um, it was too sweet, it was too nice. Uh, and I did not, I wasn't honest with myself. And I would pick it up every six, eight, 12 months and try to do some work and it, it never worked. Um, so prior to writing my dissertation, Dr. Thomas said, Jeffrey, you need to write a piece. And I was like, okay, that can be one of my projects. Sweet. So I said, I have to bring closure to um, this whole incident before I leave Tallahassee. And after much prayer, um, meditation, and being honest with myself, and um, telling God about my grief, telling him that I was angry that this happened, telling him that I was mad at him for taking those precious lives, uh, that's where my healing started. And through the process, um, maybe over the course of a summer, um, I got, he gave, not, I, think, I didn't get it. He gave me everything I needed for that piece. And um, in, in remembrance, you have, um, it's peaceful, it's, um, it's painful, and uh, there's time for repose as well. And that piece has one, that piece is one that continues to minister to people in so many different ways. I would just, I'll get a random email telling me, um, saying how much that piece meant to them or how it helped them through um, uh, losing a loved one or how it's helping them down through the pandemic um, and uh, how it's uh, just uh, a, a soothing balm for them. So that's very, very, very special. Um, so I have one last quote that I would like to read before we can talk about having any questions or further discussion. And this is from Hildred Roach, who is um, African-American musicologist. She says, 
knowledge and acceptance of this music being black music, no matter what its definition, semantics and interchange will not be affected without the benefit of concerned Americans. This music should be promoted, learned, studied, probed and considered as being American. All should invest in the enrichment of these compositions through the performance and listening experiences. Publishers and recording industries must join in with the public to support the heritage of a music which is interwoven with American tradition and whose message for all minds speaks of freedom now. Hildred Roach wrote her book, oh gosh, back in the 80s. And here we are in 2020 and words are still, they still ring true. So um, thank you for allowing me to share with you this evening. And I know we can have a little time with discussion and questions, but I'm gonna step up and turn on my light because it's on a timer. You know, be green, be green. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and I, I hope some of you have questions for him. Um, and I would like to start off by asking one, um, thinking about you and your work with young people and future educators, how do you address um, the need for diversity in programming and in music education and all that with your students? Like, do you, do you just sort of um, live into it and, or do you like actually talk to them about it or how do you prepare future music educators? Sure, I actually do both. Um, there's no greater example than doing it yourself. Um, and we learned that from our parents and grandparents and is no different as educators or st and students. Um, my students, they actually see through programming the importance of celebrating other diversities and cultures. They see the importance of inclusivity. And it's um, now in our current society, it's right there in front of your eyes. It's right there at your fingertips. Um, and you know, it's only a thumb swipe away before you know, you can see the need for acceptance in our society and in our world. And then also to see how music can truly play a role in bringing um, unity or promoting unity or promoting healing. Um, and the wonderful thing about diversity and in music programming is that, especially for um, future educators, is that they can look at their classroom. And if their classroom is a mixture of different cultures, then you can do music from those cultures. If it's not, then it's a time for exposure and it's a time for knowledge. However, what we do teach our educators, future educators right now, is that you have to do more than sing a piece in Spanish. You have to do more than sing a, a, a piece in Asian just to check off the box. Or you have to do more than sing a spiritual just because you need a great closer. Those are for the wrong reasons. And we have had, we have been taught that <laughs> by example. Uh, for so many years. And so it's just so important now that we teach our future educators to be culturally responsible and be um, and reach out to people um, who may be experts in the field. Um, as the uh, national r and &R chair for world musics and cultures, this is one um, aspect that is being, um, eyes are being opened around the country, um, that it's more than just a check mark. You know, you have to go further. And it's important for your singers and for your students too, for them just to be able to, um, to understand a little bit about the culture, okay? 
Does that is that scary as a teacher or director? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, oh goodness, I can <laughs> tell you this about three or four years ago. Um, no, it was four years ago, 2016. Um, I had, I was blessed to go and represent the U.S. with the um, International Coral Conductors Exchange Program, and I got to go to South Korea, and I came back with a whole bunch of music, and I don't know Korean, <laughs> not at all, not at all. Oh, Allison, yes, you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> Al Allison was the soloist. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. Um, and uh, so Allison, she can attest to that. Uh, how do you pronounce this? It's like, this is what it sounds like, but let me check, okay? But everything, but let me check. And it's um, it was being able to reach out to those resources that um, uh, that could speak to my students, that they could they could see a performance and um, they can do more than just just checking it off. So we have to do both. We have to teach them how to and encourage them to. Can I just piggyback on this as one of those music educators that you guys are talking about? So I, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Allison. Um, I live in Nashville, but I just finished my master's at FSU and I went to undergrad at Belmont with Dr. Ames. So Dr. Ames is one of my close teachers for my undergrad. Um, and so I just wanna say that everything that Dr. Ames is telling you about leading by example is something that he absolutely does. Um, you know, he's so amazing at including different styles of music. I mean, at, I remember doing a Haitian piece. We did the Korean piece, which was like this huge undertaking. We did all sorts of different stuff every year. You knew you were going to get like all sorts of different stuff. And I think that's kind of the nature of being at Belmont for one thing. But I also think that's definitely the nature of Dr. Ames. So as one of those oh. educators, I'm really appreciative that I know, you know, not to just be doing the stuff just to check off a box. And I just want everybody to know that uh, I seal of approval for Dr. Ames. For <laughs> You're I'm sweet. Thank you, you, Allison. Thank you. I have a question, if that's okay. Absolutely. Hello, Jeff Ames. How are you? It's good to hey. see you. Yes. Um, so I am programming Ingo Donna with my women's choir at Berry College this semester. Uh -huh. And for everybody else, I'm down in Tallahassee. Hey, um, Cassie got me here tonight, and so I'm glad to be here. Um, and <laughs> um, back there in the background is my daughter. We are in the car. So I have, that's why. I, <laughs> And she is saying hi. Um, but, um, and I programmed Indo Donna purposefully because I had talked to Dr. Barrett about how he had that arranged for the specific purpose of dealing with race relationships with his students in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And so I purposefully picked that coming back from the summer, wanting to have that as a discussion point with my women. Mm -hmm. And honestly, as a Caucasian woman, I often feel like I don't know how to approach that best with my women, you know, because what we've talked about is we've, we've looked at the text. I've talked to them about why Dr. Barrett programmed it. And I've said, how does this impact? We've put a question on our canvas of, you know, how does this impact you? How do you think we can use this for change? Where could we sing this? And how could we be use our gifts and our talents as a point for change? Mm -hmm. But I don't know what more, you know, because I, sometimes I just feel like I'm, and I know everybody's the right person to do it, but I want to make sure that I do a good job of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think my question is, what should I do? How should I handle it? What would you suggest? I think you have a wonderful start. And the first thing is being honest and transparent with your students or being honest and transparent with your choristers. It doesn't matter if they are eight or 80. They will appreciate um, when you are open and you are willing to share your heart with them. You are willing to share your fears um, 
and your questions, um, it, it really makes a huge difference because we may not be an expert in a certain area, but you are showing that we are taking a step in this direction. Um, and asking them the questions that you did is, is perfect. How does it make you feel? Um, what, what makes you feel good? What makes you feel uncomfortable? Um, and it's those type of discussions that weren't happening before that are starting to happen now. And that's what's needed. Um, with you sharing what uh, Michael Barrett uh, said about uh, his uh, uh, relations down in South Africa, that was wonderful. If you are able to get um, uh, get him to, you know, to, to to Zoom with you or just send a small video, um, that would be helpful as well. Um, Oftentimes I will, don't do it every semester, but oftentimes I will assign uh, a student a certain piece of music and say, hey, write about this. It doesn't have to be a devotional. It doesn't have to, uh, but, I'm, but it can be any thoughts and feelings that they may have about the piece because you're getting um, you're, you're allowing your choristers to really start thinking, thinking about the subject matter as well as the music. And then it will just make a, it, your performance will truly be moving because they have something that they can relate, relate to. So I think you're in, a, you're in a, the right, you're going in the right direction. We don't have all the answers and it's perfectly fine to tell our students, we don't know, I don't know all the answers. I don't know. But here's what I do know, and here's what I would like for us to try to do. And that will go so far, and your, your, your singers will appreciate you for that. That's great. Thank you so much. Because I, I just sometimes I think I feel, you know, sorry. Um, I just feel like, you know, I don't know how, you know, I, I know how to say this isn't okay. I do that when I do honor choirs. I'm like, the reason I program this stuff from South Africa is because... I can use this every time I'm in front of an honor choir and say, this isn't mm -hmm. okay. We are the change. We can be different. And so that's why mm -hmm. I program those pieces. But sometimes when I get up there, I feel like, you know, I just know to tell you this isn't okay. And we are the people that can be the change past that. I haven't had these experiences per se. And so I often don't feel like I know how, because I've not, I've not been there. Mm -hmm. So I often feel mm -hmm. like I don't know how to, to be that catalyst of guide because I haven't been there. Well, again, putting the ball in their court really makes a difference. And it could be, hey, we're back here on Friday. I want you to think about this. So we come back in and share. And even if it's uh, if it's an honor choir, um, to say, like, okay, when we come back for our evening rehearsal, let's have some things to share. And you will be amazed at how many people may just come up to you after rehearsal and say, hmm, or send you an email. It's like, I've been thinking about this a little. And so many times I've said, oh, will you please share? Will you please share this with the choir? And, um, and, and they have, they've done that and it's been appreciated. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Stephanie, I'm so glad you brought up Indodana because I, um, that is beloved by St. John's choir members, I think. Um, <laughs> Which I, I got it from Cara Tasher at Allstate Reading Chorus one year, and she actually had Michael Barrett on FaceTime talking to the choir, and that really um, <laughs> was, yeah, it really um, spoke to me, and it, it moved the kids, and so I brought it to St. John's, and Betsy was nice enough to let me do it, and um, we actually, if we ever get to go to England, <laughs> we're planning to sing it while uh -huh. we're in England, which is super cool, but um, that, all of this has made me think to... Um, just dig a little deeper, you know, with mm -hmm. the choir and really, really get more into the, the why and everything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought up that piece. I, I can tell you one thing that I'm doing with uh, Corral this semester is of course, with our current situation, we, nobody can do what we, we were used to doing. <laughs> oh, 
okay? So, and it's been more about the process rather than the product. Um, but I know that there are, are a lot of collegiate programs as I see posts online um, that are, they are, they're singing and promoting music um, by Black composers, or they are singing and promoting music about peace and inclusivity and, and awareness. And um, one thing that I uh, programmed for Corral this semester was a, um, a Victoria Oval Psalmist. Uh, oh, you people look to see if there's any sorrow like unto my sorrow. And, um, you know, it's a, 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 um, a motet that's uh, around uh, Easter and, and Lent. And, um, and then I, that has such a feeling of sorrow to it. And there's been a tremendous feeling of sorrow as a black man experiencing and reading and seeing what we've seen over the past six, eight months. But on the other hand, again, being honest with myself, I'm mad as hell. <laughs> and we cut off on um, with the, uh, we cut off with the Victoria and immediately go into Randall Stroop's Lamentations of Jeremiah. Same text, but an entirely different feel and being able to share the pain, the, the angst, the anger from um, about our uh, current situation. So I, I think that type of programming is, is, um, is really relevant and is relevant for your singers as well. Anyone else? I, Any? oh. oh, good. Good. Yay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. Um, Dr. Ames, this is Barb Wing from the yes. Community Chorus. It's um, good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, we saw Leslie last week, I think it was, or within the last couple of weeks Yay. Uh, at TCC Extra Guests. But I note that uh, Craig Zamer's Tennessee Tech Chorale is going to have a concert on tonight, and they're going to feature um, one of Marcus's Garrett's, Garrett's pieces and uh -huh. a few other pieces. So I'm, that's at uh, 8.30 our time mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. on their YouTube channel. So, Thanks for sharing Leslie, that. Yeah, Leslie had a told us about how the process of the the Christmas program that y'all do. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Glad it's not happening this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you, Barb. Uh huh. Good to see you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Ames. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. First and foremost, thank you for the amazing presentation. Um, I thoroughly was inspired and um, just, I mean, I, I thought I knew a little something, <laughs> um, but I mean, it's really gonna allow me to go back and um, really do some further investigation and research about some of the mm -hmm. composers and artists that you mentioned. I was wondering, um, um, I was going to say a former music educator, but I believe once an educator, always an educator. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but I found that when it came to multiple, multiple um, culturalism, uh -huh. um, really trying to incentivize my colleagues outside the realm of music to join together and you know work together can be somewhat challenging, given what their focus on their content area and and all the uh, nuances that goes along with teaching, um, their discipline, their, you know, content. What would you recommend to those uh, music educators or even arts specialists in regards to working together with colleagues outside the realm um, of, of the arts to promote um, cultural competency and multiculturalism? Sure. It's, uh, it's very important to, to at least to get, to get one hook. <laughs> to get one hook um, and uh, that will just 
just prove uh, so valuable. Um, and especially if it's uh, someone uh, in like a literary department or English, uh, something that may have spoken word. I know we do um, quite a bit of that with our advanced theory, like theory four, and as a study contemporary music, um, they have reached out to the uh, ensemble directors to say, what are you doing? That's 20th century. Um, but I have also uh, collaborated with um, uh, an artist to basically respond with, respond to the concert um, and produce a, a, a piece of work that was revealed at the end of the concert, it was like a ta-da, <laughs> and then explain, well, during this song, this is what I felt and how I displayed, and it was, that was very, very interesting. Um, also, uh, you, you can try to incorporate uh, the area of dance. That works very well. Um, and I have done that a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of times. But whenever you, if, if you can get um, a, uh, an English person or a person who is kind of like in, in film or, um, or, or even the sciences um, to, to get involved, you know, there is a, I know there's a piece uh, that we did several years ago entitled Singularity which is basically talks about the, the pitch that's emitted from the black hole. So I had a scientist come and be a, and be a part of that concert and just kind of give a little five minute talk before we sang it. So um, I, I would say, you know, try to, try to get one, try to, try to hook somebody, <laughs> um, just one person and to, to say, okay, maybe this is something that I'm gonna try to do every three years. Um, or every two years, okay? So it kind of gives you some time to, to brainstorm and to, um, to talk about uh, your ideas with, uh, with another colleague. And then, you know, maybe you can say, here's some music that I'm considering. What do you think about this? It's, so having them involved as well is, uh, is, a, is a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. May I ask a question or yes, two? Ma yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, where do you fit Billie Holiday in your uh, history? And also, did you teach Madison Kozak from Toronto? Um, I did. Madison Kozak doesn't uh, sound familiar. She was at Belmont. Okay. How long right. have you been there? This is uh, year 13 for me. Oh, well, okay. You should have had her. Yeah. <laughs> um, One of the Billie, faces in the crowd. <laughs> well, you know what? If I saw, I feel like my mom is like, I'll forget her name, but I'll never forget her face. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, Billie Holiday, uh, she was, um, I, I kind of put her with the female crooners. <laughs> um, uh, of course, you know, uh, a little little earlier than the uh, uh, the big jazz is Sarah Vaughn and, and um, um, Ella Fitzgerald. Um, but, you know, she was definitely, you know, a pop, pop musician um, of, of her era. So that's where I would, I would put her. Um, was she also in, 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 in the European uh, no. venue? No. no oh, I thought all. she had, had sung over there. Okay. Oh, well, no, no, she may have. Yes, she may have performed over, over in Europe. Yes, yes. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if she, if she, um, she hadn't. Uh -huh. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Any last thoughts or questions before we wrap it up? All right. Well, Dr. Ames, I really Thank appreciate you. being here and yeah. um, all of you who, a couple who, um, new faces that I didn't recognize. So that's really cool to see. Um, and I think this has been great and it's given us a lot to think about. And I de I'm all about the history. I love it. And so I, I enjoyed learning some about people that I didn't know, know about previously. So. Well, it's uh, great, to, great to see. 
um, see some familiar faces, like the two Michaels and the Betsy. That's all yeah. on the line. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. And so uh, great to see Allison again and uh, Stephanie. So, uh, well, one quick and question. Barb. So, yes. I'm sorry. I saw in your, I think it was your um, bio that you work with Denise Graves. Yes. Yes. That, that was. I'm sorry. I'm a, oh. I'm a huge fan. She's on my bucket list to me. Yeah. I crossed off Kathleen. Um, Kathleen Battle, I crossed off Renee Fleming now, hoping to get to Miss Graves. Um, yeah, she's she's a doll. <laughs> she really is. She's a doll, uh, a wonderful person with a beautiful spirit and a beautiful soul. Um, and uh, we had her back in 2012 was when we had a brand new concert hall um, and McAfee Concert Hall, which is great in my opinion is the best sounding hall in nashville so if you ever come to nashville you want to come to mcafee concert hall on belmont campus and you won't you won't be uh you won't be sad at all and um so during that gala year we had about six or eight special performances and um and i did a unity concert um in which uh we had her featured as soloist so wow. um, we did that in 2012, and then we invited her back to be um, a performing artist with Christmas at Belmont in 2013, and and so we uh, we still keep in touch. So she's she's beautiful, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, she is. thank you for sharing. <laughs> thank you. Well, thanks again, everybody. Thank you, um, St. John's, for uh, sponsoring this, and Betsy and Mike, and. Uh, everybody else who helped me uh, sort of bat around some ideas and topics. And I'm just glad to be able to, um, to welcome some old friends back. It's been great. Um, so yeah, um, we'll see you all later. Thank you so much. Thanks, You're Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. How are all of you doing? We're doing well, Barb. How are you? I'm hanging in there. I'm good. There. Taking care uh, of my friends yeah. furry boys this week while she's resting after finishing up her um yeah. full time of car. Full time employment. Good. Well it's good to see you. Good Hi, to see Suzanne. you. Hi, Suzanne. Ran Ermine, into I don't know, Ermine, but it's good to see your name. Yeah. So we're going to go eat now. But anyway, it's good to see y'all. Yeah. Okay. Good. Take care. Bye. Hi, Suzanne.